you, and uh, welcome. It's wonderful to see you all here. I'm really eager to share with you the system I've, that has blessed my family and me for a number of years. Really, to get organized, all you need is a system and the follow-through. So the system is what I'll be sharing with you today. And the follow-through, well, you know, sometimes the follow-through can wax and wane. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a fault with the system, but it's just that life happens and our ability to maintain the system and keep up with it can kind of change. So homeschooling, as you know, adds an entire new layer of uh, challenge to, home, to organizing. Do you consider yourself a very naturally organized person, or you know, someone who has a natural intuition for keeping things organized. Would you say you're one of those? Raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. And how many of you would say you're just naturally disorganized? You know, the more creative types, you know, the more artsy. Okay, great. Well, um, the good news is that for the research that I did for this talk and presentation, uh, a number of the professional organizers will tell you that they were naturally completely disorganized. They were the kids who grew up with disaster zone bedrooms whose parents had no idea what to do with them. But they discovered the system for keeping things organized and it brought so much peace and joy to their lives that they wanted to share that with others and became professional organizers. So I'll be sharing that with you too. Um, just to give you a little background, um, I grew up the fifth of six children, and um, sorry, not yet. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. She was a homemaker, so we all went to school. But uh, you know, when I came home, the house was organized, and she did all the meals and the laundry and all those kinds of things. So I, you know, was involved in extracurriculars and those kinds of things. So I never really learned the skills of how those things happened. I didn't know how those things got done because I was really focused on the things I was doing outside of the home. So then I grow, grew up and got married, and it was still okay because you start small, right? It's just you and your husband. We didn't have a lot of stuff. We didn't have a lot that needed to be organized, so I could kind of keep up and hold my own. But I tell you, when I was pregnant with my fourth, that's when it all fell apart, and I just said, you know, I was in way over my head, totally overwhelmed, had no idea where to even start organizing all the stuff that we had now accumulated, and I was starting to look at homeschooling. So that's when I went to the library and found this very book. It's called Organizing from the Inside Out by Julie Morgenstern. You're familiar with yes, it? Yes, I read the book. Okay, great. I read the book, took copious notes, and um, it helped a great deal. In fact, that baby I was pregnant with is now almost 16 years old, and the system has helped us and you know, been you know, helpful all those years. So that's the system I'm going to share with you. I also did a little more research, though, on other you know, organizational systems, and they all have a lot of things in common. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They all have their quirks, but yes, there is a general base. Right, it just shares you know, a lot of the same, same methods. So I'll be sharing those with you. Okay. But I wanted to start with a little inspiration. I love this poem. It's called Little Things by Ebenezer Cobham Brewer. Little drops of water, little grains of sand, make the mighty ocean and the pleasant land. Thus the little minutes, humble though they be, make the mighty ages of eternity. So I want to encourage you that it's the little things, the little habits, the little changes that can bear much fruit over time. And I would encourage you to memorize this poem, have your children memorize this poem, because whenever they complain about, wow, do I have to practice piano every day? Why do I have to do these math facts every day? Or it's the little day-to-day -day things that you do consistently and regularly and faithfully that then turn into these wonderful blessings in your life. But as with everything, we have to keep first things first. We know that God is a God of order. We read in the book of Genesis when he created the world that the, it all started off with the, it was just a formless wasteland. Some uh, translations will call it a uh, chaos, that God brought order out of the chaos. So keep that in mind whenever you're tidying your home, whenever you're cleaning, whenever you're picking up that you are imitating our creator 
in doing that work. It may seem mundane. It may seem insignificant or unimportant. But again, it's those little things that uh, is how we imitate God. So our desire for order in our homes and schedules is good, holy, and right. But I had a conversation with a priest, and I can't remember exactly the context of the conversation. I'm not sure what I had shared with him, but he said to me, you know, we often get this wrong. We think that if we can keep our homes tidy enough, if we can get it all together on the outside, then it will follow that we will be ordered interiorly. But that's not how it works. The reality is the order on the inside, ordering your soul, ordering your heart, ordering your mind, that is what will bring about order in the, on, the ex, on the outside. It has to flow from what you have on the inside. And that made sense to me. I mean, it was kind of a revelation, but at the same time, it's consistent. You know, Scripture teaches us, and in fact, it was today's gospel passage for today's Mass, um, that we seek first the kingdom, and the rest will be added to you. So that's what we're called to do. So make sure that the top priority is loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that you are doing His will in all things, and that relationship is your top priority. And order your interior life. Keep that tidy and neat. And then the other things will, be, will take care of themselves. So as St. Ignatius of Loyola says, pray as though it all depends on God, but work as though it all depends on you. So if being organized is our goal, what does that look like? We should have some clarity in what the definition of organization is. You know, a lot of people will say that being organized is you walk into their home and it's not cluttered and everything looks like it's in its proper place, everything is clean and, you know, all those kinds of things. But Julie Morgenstern in her book says that organization has less to do with how the environment looks than how it functions. That was exciting to me. (laughs) I am much more a practical, functional type person than a decorator. I'm not a Martha Stewart type, and I think it's great for those who are. But, you know, that was not the goal then. The goal is if you can find what you need when you need it, if you can feel confident about achieving your goals and are happy in your space, then you are well organized. And the beauty of that formula is that it's going to look different for every single person in this room, and that's okay. That's, you know, that's the beauty of it. We shouldn't compare ourselves and always try to make our homes look like that person's home. Or, you know, there's a great temptation with social media and blogs, and you're always kind of trying to measure up to these things. But it's not about that. It's about what's going to work for you and your family. Really, the purpose of organizing is to bring more peace and order to your days. So education is an atmosphere, a discipline, and a life, according to Charlotte Mason. So it really is important, the atmosphere, the tone you set in your home. The more organized you are, the more there will be peace in that environment. You can focus on what's really important, uh, the being together, the discussions, the reading, rather than you know, frantically trying to find things and being in a rush and the pressure of those kinds of things. Now, I'm sure you've all experienced some of the benefits to being organized. You know, there's that little, you know, you get a drawer cleaned out or your closet cleaned out, and wow, that's just a little, you know, thrill that you have for being organized. But to put it to words, you know, it's nice to see, you know, the list to help motivate us, keep us motivated to keep doing the follow-through. You will achieve more in less time. You know, when things are convenient, it's a lot easier to motivate yourself to do them. It's when it's going to be a big job just to even start this job, then you're less likely to do it. So when things are more convenient, you'll be achieving more. It reduces that sense of being overwhelmed. And it sets a great example for our children. You know, it's interesting how they will learn to value being tidy. They will learn to uh, follow your example of, you know, putting things where they belong, that sort of thing. It's, again, the little things that you do every day. You're able to spend more time on what's important. It increases your efficiency, increased focus on your goals. There's less distraction, less stress, more peace overall. And it saves money because you aren't buying duplicates of things you didn't even know you had. 
Um, another source I used for this talk, um, I'll share with you some of her books, is uh, Kathy Lipp. She also gives a definition to clutter. She defines clutter as anything that has not earned a right to be in your home or anything that has earned a right to be in your home but has not been given a home, a place, a special place. So, um, you know, she talks a lot about uh, thinking about those things and being intentional about what you possess, what you still have. So I'm going to be talking to you. I'm dividing the talk up into two different parts. There's organizing the physical environment, which, again, is the formula I used from the book, organizing from the inside out, and then time. Now, Julie Morgenstern in the book also talks about organizing time. It's kind of towards the back of the book. She uses the same model. And so I will show that model to you, but I also wanted to show some other examples and samples of how you could order your day. Because again, everybody is very different. We all have different personalities, different approaches, different schedules, different needs. And so it'll give you just some ideas of what you can do to set up your homeschool. So starting with the physical environment, Julie Morgenstern uses a kindergarten model of organization. I thought, wouldn't it be great if I was in a kindergarten classroom and the whole room could kind of be the prop and I could show you how they set it up? But it really is more of a preschool model nowadays because it was the time when kids just came to play. So you'd walk in the room and you would see the little kitchen center where there's a refrigerator and a sink and um, all the play food was there, maybe a chef's hat, an apron. That would be in the kitchen corner. And then in another corner, there would be the blocks for building. There'd be different sizes, different colors, types, and a little mat for building. Maybe there was a reading corner with, you know, bean bags and other, um, you know, bookshelves and baskets of books for reading. Or maybe, um, you know, it might be a puppet place, you know, where they could play puppets or reenact the things they've read. Um, you know, you kind of get the idea. There was a zone for everything. Everything was zoned off. And uh, then everything, it was easy to focus on one activity at a time. Oh, there'd be a dress-up center, you know, where you'd have all the dress-up clothes. But it would all be self-contained. It would all, uh, every, all the items were stored at their point of use. Everything had its home, had its place. So even if a block came over here, everybody knew that, that goes in the block corner or the you know, dress-up clothes, same thing. So everything having a home, this is how we anchor things. If you anchor things by um, putting something where it goes every time. So if you said, all the scissors in this house belong in this drawer, you are anchoring scissors to this drawer. And that way uh, everybody knows and everybody can follow through with that. So in this model, everything is anchored to something else. And there is a visual menu of everything that's important. So let's apply this model to our home schools. Now, whatever space you would do to homeschool, and this is different for everybody as well, it might just be your dining room. It might be a special room set aside for your homeschool. It could be that you use three different rooms for your homeschooling. But just think about your space in general that you're going to be using to homeschool. And then what you would do is you would divide that space into zones. You would have your activity zones. So one might be the space where your children could work independently, where they're doing work that doesn't require your assistance. You would set up a space for them to come together to do group work. So that's where you can all come together and do the read-alouds or other things that you would do as a group. You would have a you know, teacher space, like back there is the teacher zone where you would have the tape, the desk, the chair, you know, the things you need there. Um, you would have your book storage. Where are you going to store all the curriculum and all the books you're going to be reading for that year? And you have a computer space for those who are doing online classes or those typing and doing papers. And then a space for manipulatives, for the hands-on work that you would be doing. So think of zoning your space there into those activities. And as you see it, it's easy to focus on one activity at a time that way. So the students are, who are working independently can really concentrate. You don't want it to be a high traffic area where there's a lot of coming and going, but where it's more quiet and where they can focus on their work. Um, students doing group work would have all the materials accessible. So you would have the books that you're reading right there. If you're doing map work for geography together, you would have your maps and your pencils and markers and things right there. Um, the teacher table would have all your answer keys for the th corrections you need to make for the books. 
And it'd also be a place where students can turn in the work that needs to be corrected. You could store books in portable baskets, so your, your book space, there's a lot of different ways you can do book storage. So you can use baskets, you can do shelves. Um, we also, there's work boxes, and I'm gonna show that to you in a little, little bit. Um, but lots of different ways that you can think about storing the books. And the computer area, which should be equipped with the microphone and headset if, the, if you're doing online classes, or else other necessities for writing papers. So like the dictionary, the thesaurus, or the IEW student resource notebook, all of those would be right there at the computer where you're doing that kind of work. And then finally, the manipulatives are stored where hands-on activities are done. So we have kind of a cabinet where we do, with the table and chairs, where we do the math manipulatives and those kinds of things. So you can set it up that way. So again, items are stored at their point of use. Each zone has easy access and retrieval of any item needed to perform the activity. Everything has a home. Everything is anchored. So it's quick, easy, and convenient to put things away, and cluttering doesn't become a problem. And the visual menu, this is, what, this is really the beauty of it. Uh, the surroundings give you the cues as to what there is to do. So when life gets busy, you can just take a glance at your environment and see you know, what you need to focus on. So sometimes I remember walking into the schoolroom and just being so many moving parts, so many things going on that day, but I could see that there was a pile of books that needed to be corrected on my teacher table, so I could go right there and start correcting books. So you could see exactly what needs to be done. Or students who um, are sitting at the group area table, you know, waiting to do our group work, that's where you can get focused. Um, so where to start? Um, I would suggest picking the space that you spend your most time in. But if there is a space in your home that is really irritating to you in terms of clutter or um, confusing to use or not being, you know, not being used well, some people like to choose the space that people will see first when, if you have guests come to your home. They want to clean up that space first. But pick the space that uh, will is most important to you. And you can either start small, like just doing one shelf or one drawer, and, which would be less overwhelming and the reward comes a little more quickly. Or if you want to start big, you know, choose the whole space, the whole room, and you will experience the bigger payoff. But again, it's kind of a personality thing. If you get overwhelmed easily, easily then you might want to start small and just pick one thing to organize and uh, just uh, build from there. There are, these are the main three steps to organizing. Analyze, strategize, and attack. That seems so simple and so basic, but yet very useful and powerful. In fact, these three steps are steps that I use for any kind of problem solving or when there's any kind of overwhelmness going on. So my high schooler came to me the other day and said, Mom, I have to write a paper on what Catholic leadership means to me. I, I, I don't even know where to start with that. So I said, okay, let's try the three steps. We're going to analyze, and that's where you ask the questions. Um, what have you read about this? What are your thoughts about this? You know, just that brainstorming session. And then strategize. That's where you write out your outline or you put it in a web. You know, what helps you to organize all that information? And the last thing, attack, just that's when you sit down and start writing. But it's, it's easy to break things down um, when you're feeling overwhelmed or you know, having difficulty with something. But I'll show you what these steps look like when it comes to organizing. The analyze step uh, has these main questions. So first of all, it's really good to ask yourself, what is working? Because again, we're all unique. We're all very different. And what works for me will not work for you and that sort of thing. So when you look at what's working for you, then you have a model right there for what you can apply to the areas that are not working. So for an example, what was working well in my home was my library book system. I had a basket for my library books. Everybody knew the books were anchored to this basket and that's where they belonged, that's where they needed to be turned. So even if they took them to other places in the house, it was really important that they be put back there. If anyone found a library book anywhere else in the house, it was, uh-oh, 
this has to go back to the basket. It was that firmly ingrained. Um, also, I had myself, you know, a system where I would check every week. So Tuesday was my library day. So it was anchored to a day in the week where I would check my account to see if any books were due. And if they were and I was still using them, I would renew them. And if I couldn't renew them, then we would just return them that day. So I had a library day. And this system was flawless. We checked out books for years with all these children and never had an overday, overdue notice. But let me tell you what didn't work. <laughs> Next question, what's not working? My home library system is a mess. I, and the reason for that really is because I didn't have a system. You know, I had the system for the library books because I would be punished if basically there were consequences to not keeping that organized. But the consequence to not keeping my home library organized was the frustration when I couldn't find books I was looking for, the time wasted in looking all over the place for books that I still couldn't find, um, all of those kinds of things. So the next question then is, what items are essential to you? So uh, most organizers, and Julie Morgenstern talks about the 80-20 rule. She says that 80% of what we own is stuff we once used, feel that we should use, or think we may someday use. But we really only use 20% of the stuff we own. So applying that to my home library, I would call through my books and see what books are we actually reading and enjoying. And you can really pare it down that way. <laughs> Number four, why do you want to get organized? And again, that's the question you know all of us should ask ourselves once in a while. What, why am I doing this? Because you do have to invest a little bit of time and effort and energy into being organized. So why do you want to get organized? Of course, the obvious answer for me was, you know, when I, the blueberries are on sale at the grocery store and I'm inspired to read Blueberries for Sal with my younger kids, uh, I want to be able to find it. I want to know where to look and not waste a whole bunch of time and getting frustrated and not reading it at all. So um, I wanted to save all the aggravation, all the difficulties of not finding things that I needed. And then number five, what's holding you back? And again, more often than not, it's that you have not taken the time or you haven't made the time to think through a solution to the problem. So going back to step number one, you know, we're at the beginning, analyze what's working, what's not working, and what's holding you back from making it work. Which brings us to step two. So we've gone through that whole process. Now we want to strategize. List the main activities that take place in your space and plan out activity zones. So using my book example, I would have a certain amount of space in my home, a certain amount of bookshelves um, that I could use, and I would zone them out. I actually started using uh, boxes, and I would label them January or February, March, and and I would put books in these boxes and store the boxes in my garage because a lot of them were related to feast days of the saints or seasonal things, you know, Halloween books in October, Thanksgiving books in November, uh, all the Advent Christmas books in December. And so that was a way for me to anchor, you know, different categories of books. And then shelves. I would have a shelf for the toddler books, the chunky books, the... Um, the books that were really tall and big and couldn't fit on other shelves and uh, would kind of anchor them that way. Um, you want to develop a clear picture of your goal. What do you want it to look like? How do you want it to work? Uh, visualize what you want it to look like once you get it organized and use this model of kindergarten classroom. So again, it's a very simple and effective model. You just kind of get into that habit of seeing things and zoning them out and planning accordingly. Which brings us to step three, the attack, the actual doing it. So now you've planned it all out. You've figured out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Um, clear the space, the shelf, the drawer, the room, the closet, whatever you have decided to start with. Clear it. Get all the stuff so you can actually see how much you do own. And then you're going to clean thoroughly the space it was taking up. Then you want to make piles of what you're going to keep, throw away, or give away. Now, um, Kathy Lipp 
suggested, you know, we, you've all heard about using the boxes, you know, the boxing. She says to use totes because otherwise you end up, at the end of the day, you've got these boxes sitting around your house and then your kids want to make cars out of them or refrigerator, things like that. So these you can fold up and put away. So she has a tote for, you know, when you're organizing like your shelf or your drawer, you'd put the things you're going to put back in there in the purple tote, the things that you're going to give away in the green tote, and the orange one is, you know, that these belong in other rooms. This is not the correct home or space for these items. And, of course, you would have your trash can for the things you're not, you know, going to keep. Um, and she suggests, of course, just taking, you know, 10 or 15 minutes every day and just making it a daily habit to go through these things and organize rather than trying to just make it a summer project that, okay, this summer we're going to get organized, but it's kind of hard to do that because there's a lot of other things going on in the summer as well. And, of course, store things where you will use them, where they will be easily accessible. That was always very helpful to me all through the years when I would run into the problem of not being able to find things that I needed. And I would say, you know, where I have it doesn't make sense. It's not where I use it. And then I would try to brainstorm how I could make it more accessible. Okay, so organization tips for homeschool environment. These are just some tips I've kind of picked up through the years that I wanted to share with you. The first one would be to keep your high school students with you. Now, I made the mistake with my oldest daughter of having her work in a space upstairs in a nice, quiet bedroom so that she wouldn't have all the distraction of the babies and the toddlers and everything going on downstairs. She'd be able to really focus on her schoolwork and that sort of thing. Problem was, we'd come to the end of the day, and she wasn't finished with her work, and I would think, Wow, it's taking her a long time. She must have a lot of work going on. And I would follow up with her. And uh, a consultant then told me, you know, um, what if you were in a room by yourself and you had hours to accomplish what you needed to do? How much of that would be really fruitful time that, you know, you were disciplined enough to be working all that time and not getting distracted with perhaps less uh, worthy <coughs> pursuits? I mean, we expect that of our high schoolers, so really you need to provide the accountability all through high school, that um, you know what your students are doing, and they should be part of the family. It really made a lot of sense to keep them with us. And sometimes they're called on to help with the toddler or the baby. They shouldn't be like in some special place where they are free from all of those cares and concerns. They're still part of the family, and we wanted them to be very integrated. Keep the computers in open areas where you can closely supervise. Um, same idea. You know, it's very tempting to do some email or go surfing on the net or whatever. Um, but it's important to provide that accountability. And also for safety. We have covenant, covenant eyes as a filter for uh, our Internet and everything. But still, you always need to be aware of what your kids are doing on the screen, how much time they're using there. So keep those in open areas. Something as simple as keeping pencils sharpened and ready to go. You know, have the little ones make that a daily chore for them. Mm -hmm. I can tell you how many times we've sat down to do lessons and every pencil and every pencil <laughs> cup was broken or something. And then you had to go find the pencil sharpener and then we couldn't find the pencil sharpener. And, you know, again, just the frustration with that. So little things like that. Think about what are the things that cause you to uh, not be as efficient as you could be or not be as peaceful as you go through your day. And just find little solutions that would help with that. Make the materials, again, accessible where you're, where you're using them. So it's easy to take out, easy to put back. So here's a workbox system. Um, this was uh, popular a few years ago. I'm not, I don't hear about it as much now. Um, but it's basically this set of 10 drawers that you can have, especially younger students, keep their curriculum in. So the top drawers are the subjects that I would have my students do first. So as they go through the day, they start with the top and work their way down. So the top drawer is math, and then math drill, then maybe they're Latin, or you know some of those. Or you can mix it up a little bit, um, where they're doing more uh, difficult work like math, and then break it up with some copy work or things like that. But you can kind of decide the order of the, how they're doing their independent work. And um, it's a nice way to organize the books. So you know everything they need for math is in that drawer. 
Everything they need for Latin is in the next drawer. Everything they need for their handwriting is in the next drawer. So it's another way that you can organize for that. Um, so this is an example of my middle school student. So she has her desk there. So again, everything is accessible, retrievable, easy to use, easy to put back. And, um, and that's how she would work. But she had her desk right there. Okay. And then this one is where I, for my two little guys who cannot work independently at all. It's almost more of an organization thing for me because I can then go and work with them. But I take the books from the work box and go work at the table with them. And then I just teach them how to get the books in and out of the work boxes. But they're still pretty young yet, so they're um, needing a lot of that guidance from me yet. And then in high school, I just put on here, then you know, once they get to a certain point, they've learned how to organize their books and you know what they need for everything. So then they just keep it on a, they have a designated bookshelf for themselves. So. OK, so let's talk about organizing time. So you're going to, using Julie Morgenstern's model, you would follow the same steps. So first of all, analyze what's working with your schedule, what's not working, what activities are the most essential to you. This is the conversation you'd have with your husband, how many of these activities are really important. Follow that 80-20 rule. Again, I think a lot of things we can clutter up our schedules with are things that may not be that important. And um, we want to really clear out the things that are less important. Why do you want to get organized? Again, organizing really is a way for us to get more. Um, no problem. <laughs> it's a way for us all to just get you know, more peace in our days, more time focused on what's really important. And then what's causing the problems? Typically, it's taking on too much and unclear goals and priorities. So kind of like our physical environment, you only have so much space to work with. The bookshelf can only hold so many books. Well, same with time. There are only so many hours in a day. And so that's kind of your limit. And you have to organize within the limits that you have. So it's important to really um, prioritize that clearly. OK? Then, um, then we want to strategize. So she suggests, again, using the zone model, you're going to zone out your day. Plan your zones. Now, because of the PowerPoint presentation, uh, there's a limited amount of space, so that was my limitation here. But obviously, you know, there's more hours, and you could plan out their waking time and what time you go to bed at night and those kinds of things. But just to give you an example, um, you would want to zone out, you know, these are our meal times, and of course, that can change day to day. But for the most part, I found that it works really well for children to be consistent with those. I mean, it almost like sets up their appetites and when they're hungry and when they're not, if you're pretty consistent with meal times throughout the day. So um, plan those things that happen. And then the next step would be to reserve slots for outside activities. So think about any errands that you do consistently, the appointments, your lessons, meetings you participate in. So we have piano lessons every Tuesday. We would do park day on Thursdays. We do groceries in the evening on Fridays. So you would add those onto your time map. And again, this would make it really clear to you if you have things going on every day, that could really, you start, when you start breaking a sweat just looking at your time map, then you know you've taken on too much. <laughs> so the next one, then you're going to write in the subjects that you need to do every day. So we do math every day, you know, religion. Again, if I had more space, you know, there'd be Latin. You do language arts every day, but maybe spelling a couple days a week or handwriting a couple days a week. You know, those things are a little more variable. But you just start plugging those in. And then lastly, you would put in your variety of subjects, like history and science, those kinds of things, which may not happen every day. OK, so um, I'm going to share with you a sample schedule. Was anyone here last year for Ginny Sufert's talk? She spoke last year. OK, I was really surprised. Um, she had 12 children, and she homeschooled over 20 years. And um, she gave us her sample schedule. She said, this is the schedule we use. We did this you know, for 20-some years. It just worked. And it was really surprising to me how you know, closely, closely it was to our schedule. Very same thing with 5.30. 
you know, you want to get up before your kids. You want to put first things first. You want to order your soul and your heart and your mind so that you can be prepared to take on the day. So again, you're treating homeschooling like a full-time job. If you had to get up and report to work at a certain time, you would be disciplined enough to get up at those, you know, whatever time you need to get up. Um, then you'd get the children up. They could do their morning routine, you know, putting their pajamas under the pillow or brushing their teeth or tidying up their room, whatever their routine is. Um, you would anchor that routine to that wake-up time. Then everyone comes down for breakfast. And then just a quick cleanup. We don't even bother to do our breakfast dishes at that time because I want to get a strong start to our day. Um, we do the dishes later. Um, when we start school, the older kids start independently, or you know, we start with our prayer and our pledge calendar, those kinds of things. Um, so again, due to the space limitation of this, I don't have a lot of the details on here, but it just kind of gives you an idea. Um, and then we have at 11 o'clock, uh, and when your kids are old enough, what you can do is assign a lunch day to them. This has been wonderful because they learn then the life skills of how to prepare meals and you know help take care of a family. So every day of the week, uh, a different child is assigned to making lunch for that day. So 11 o'clock is when they have to prep for lunch. They have to learn to put on the grocery list whatever things they would need. So when they come to me and say, well, I was going to have you know macaroni and cheese for lunch today, but we don't have any pasta, then you said, well, you're going to have to figure something else out, and pretty quickly. So they learn, you know, that they have to plan ahead. That's one of the organizational skills is, you know, looking ahead to what is going to have to happen later so that you're not in a crunch. Um, and that way mom can continue working with the little ones right up to lunchtime. And, you know, usually you can finish school with your younger kids in the morning if you're pretty focused and working through things. And then after lunch, that's when we take more time to do you know, the dishes and the cleaning up. And that's when I read to the younger ones and get the little ones down for naps. And that makes it nice and quiet time for me to work with the older students. Um, we have what's called a directed reading time. Laura Berquist has always uh, encouraged this, where there's a set time every day for everybody just to be still and quiet and read, think, or pray. You know, just That's it. It's a quiet time for the whole day. Um, we come together for another snack at 3. We do a daily rosary together. Um, now, we used to do cleaning on Saturdays. So cleaning was anchored to Saturdays. So I, I felt like then I could just focus all the days on, you know, the homeschooling, that that was enough. I couldn't think of doing any more than that. But what ended up happening was then, you know, if there was any activities going on on the weekend, it became very daunting to think about having to clean on Saturday. And not only that, but it, it seemed much more overwhelming because there was a lot of cleaning then that needs to happen. You have all your bathrooms and the vacuuming and the dusting. So um, once I came across this idea, again, you kind of time box it. So if you look at doing maybe just 15 or 20 minutes of cleaning a day, less overwhelming, less daunting, more likely to happen. And so we uh, have Mondays where we clean bathrooms. And again, you involve all your children in this. This is not mom is the cleaning lady. This is, this is a family affair. So um, I would assign a young, an older student with a younger student, and each of them would get a bathroom. So we have three bathrooms, and so six of the kids are working in those bathrooms, and I'm the one who's the inspector saying, this is still dirty or you need to do that sort of thing. Um, yeah, Tuesday dusting, and that's more fun. You know, you can give everybody their dusting cloth or wand or whatever you do. And just, again, you're coaching them as you go, you know, the horizontal spaces and those kinds of things. But if they set the timer, they're much more willing to cooperate. They say, just 15 minutes, right? And, you know, they're sure to get the timer out. Um, but then you do your dusting, but then you're ready to do all the vacuuming the next day because the dusting has already happened and all the dust is on the floor. And same thing with the mopping. And then Friday, then everybody can pick one little shelf or drawer or their desk for organizing and getting it ready for school the next week. And then we try to have dinner at 6. So that's just one sample. Um, I wanted to include this. Are any of you familiar with Lee Borton? She, uh, she started the Classical Conversations Co-op. And she had a book. It's really interesting. But she had in here her schedule for how she does homeschooling. And she recommends this to all families, no matter you know, how many kids they have, that sort of thing. That it is another system. It's very interesting to look at, something you might want to try. She plans her day with four hour long academic periods. So the beauty of this system is it's not tied to a time. 
So let's say you had appointments in the morning and you couldn't get much school done in the morning. Well, you could do maybe one academic period in the morning, three in the afternoon. Or you could try to do three academic periods in the morning, one in the afternoon. Or depending on your husband's work schedule, if he's home in the evening and you want help with a certain subject area, then he could do, you could do one academic period in the evening, uh, two in the afternoon, or two in the morning. You know, whatever works for you. But there's some mixing and matching and some variety that can go on. It's not quite as uh, routine and that sort of thing. So this may work for some people. Or even if you have more of a scheduled day, like mine, you know, kind of looks, I still utilize this idea of the academic periods. So at the beginning of, I'm sorry if this is a little confusing. It was kind of a lot of information to pack into a small space. So if you have more questions about this, I'll be happy to talk to you more about it later. Or again, if you have your email, I'm happy to give you more information. But basically, at the beginning of every academic period, she would set her timer for 20 minutes. And during that 20 minutes, all the older kids are working independently. So let's take math for an example. If you're doing your math period, they're all doing their math. You work for 20 minutes with the youngest child, and you can do preschool or kindergarten or first grade math in 20 minutes. That child will then be finished. He can go off to play or play, entertain the toddler or whatever. And then um, you would work with the next child, the next oldest child, and you would have 10 minutes to work one-on-one -on -one with that child, answering any questions, correcting the math that he just worked on for 20 minutes independently, um, you know, the direct instructional time with that child. And then the next 10 minutes, you'd work with the next child. And then the last one would be your high schooler, again, going over any questions, problems, or any mental work or flashcards, that kind of thing. But she would keep it to these times. And she said that you learn to um, work more efficiently. So again, kind of like the cleaning idea. If you know you're only going to be doing it for 15 minutes, then it's more of that burst of energy that you're willing to apply to it. But if you think something's going to take you forever, you're more likely to dawdle and not to do as well anyway. So it's using the time really efficiently. The memory work uh, period was kind of the same idea, except you're not relying on the timer so much because that's what time she would use for doing your group work. So you'd all come together to work on the things you're all doing together. So again, if you're in like the co-op setting where you do memory work and everybody's memorizing the same kinds of information, um, or it'd be a time for recitation where your child is reciting to you the things they've memorized, your catechism or reciting poetry. It could be the Latin chants that you're doing, history timeline. You know, any map work with your geography, that kind of thing would be done during that hour where you're all working together. Um, her reading hour uh, would be set up with three rotations where you do the silent reading, the children practice reading aloud, and your instructional reading. So again, you start off with everyone silently reading, except with the younger one who doesn't do that yet, they're reading aloud to you. Um, but you keep having your children read aloud to you even as they get older so that they can practice their fluency and keep improving the reading skills. Or if there's some, you know, it, it's again, uh, it enables you as the mother and the teacher to see if there's some problem with the reading that um, you could help them fix or provide more instruction for. Um, and then this is when the teens would read for their assignments. And then for writing, the writing block, she even has the toddlers coloring and drawing. Preschoolers can do their writing exercises. Again, for the little one, it's just 10, or 15, 10 15, or 20 minutes. Um, the older ones will take longer with copy work or writing assignments that they may have. So on the next slide here, I show you kind of how that would look with just one academic period. So if you were starting at 9 o'clock, um, all of the kids are working, and the mom is working with the pre-kindergartner. So this is if you had five kids at these ages doing school. So of course, if you had fewer kids, that gives you more time with each of them individually and so forth. So, um, and so you kind of see how that all plays out. You're working with the oldest ones for the last 10 minutes. So again, the whole point of organizing is to free you up for what's the most important. And the most important thing is that peace and serenity that you have with your family. So I really love this quote by Father Jacques Philippe. It's in his book called Time for God. And I'll just go ahead and read that to you. Um, this is an entire paragraph, but it was so good that I could not just pick out one or two sentences. It was beautiful. One of the great crises of our day is that people are no longer capable of finding time for one another. 
here is something that causes many deep wounds. So many children are enclosed within themselves, disillusioned and damaged because their parents never learned to spend time with them with nothing else to do except be with that child. Well, sure, they, they look after the child, but they are always doing something else or are preoccupied, never entirely there, never totally available. And the child senses this and suffers. In learning to give time to God, we will certainly become more able to find time to be there for one another. Our attentiveness to God will teach us to be attentive to others. So that is my hope and prayer for you. I hope that you have many blessings during this school year. Um, I hope there's a little time. There's some time left over if you had any questions about specific organizational questions that you might have. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Did you help? So if you have, um, like myself and I have a lot of little ones, um, a lot of that time, like if I would have a schedule, that would be really, we can kind of have a general schedule, but sometimes there's a lot, you know, we're still teaching them how to live in a family. Mm -hmm. And so I know as the, as more are born, I, I've seen that they fall into what the others have already learned. Mm -hmm. But while we're in the process of training the older ones, the two older ones, there's a lot of um, time that we would have wanted to spend this week, but it's not possible because we're in the process of training and teaching them. And they're sure. fighting and, you know, upset. And <laughs> yes. You know, and I don't want to, you know, different things. So that will get better through time and, and we'll able to get into it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yes. It, it, you know, it, there are very unique times in your life. There are seasons to your family life, your homeschooling. And so you have to be really patient. There's a lot of grace during those years. And you will see many fruits, but, you know, it's a little ways off. But I mean, you always have to keep in mind we're building cathedrals. And so oftentimes you're not going to see the fruits for a long time. But you kind of keep the, you know, the, the structure, the form in mind but there's a great deal of flexibility and movement within that structure. But it's kind of this like safety net, I guess, that you can always fall back on once your children start, you know, being more capable of falling within that structure. But you know, little ones are by nature chaotic, and you know, so it's again that idea you're bringing order out of chaos. But it's a long process for you know children. So just being very patient with that would be helpful. Sure. Yes. Uh, on one of your slides, you mentioned um, keep high school students with you, don't have them work in a separate room. Does that also apply to little ones? We have oh. a, a third grader. Hmm. Absolutely. I, I feel very strongly about that. that um, you want to create this, you know, we're all in it together kind of <laughs> idea. Um, they learn, I think they learn pretty well to cope with the distractions. Um, but it's better for them to have this real sense of we're here together working in this space. I'm not being, you know, kind of delegated to some other space or, you know, and it helps me to be more on top of what they're doing as well. I think it's very important and it will really, you know, be helpful to them um, in spite of the distractions. So, yeah? How do you handle the distractions? You would never really trying to plow through an algebra problem and insisting on that silence in the entire family area. Mm -hmm. You've got squibble and squabble over the table and you can't like, read up markers. <laughs> what do you do? Like, do you send the squibble squabble away or do you say, dear algebra, like, here's a room, mm -hmm. you have 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the way I do it is I go after what's causing the problem. So. You know, I try to tell everybody, you know, to be respectful. They're concentrating. Um, but, yes, the squibbles and squabbles occur anyway. Um, but trying to teach them to peacefully work that out. But that is just a normal part of life at our house. When the younger ones are done so much earlier, how do you structure their, because leaving them to their own devices doesn't yeah. usually end well, <laughs> you know, um, at least not for a while. Yeah. Well, there's the, um, 
if you have a nearby area for you know games and toys that only are brought out during that time, that can help. Um, otherwise, uh, I did have uh, I would call it play time, where yeah I only took out certain toys and let them play in that time. Or else, again, depending on what your older students are able to do, they would have to take shifts. You have to take 10 minutes from your schooling and babysit here. So I can finish with these kids this morning, and I can then help you in the afternoon. Or even 15 minutes. Sometimes I have the high schoolers rotate 15 minutes if we're having a particularly rough patch. So it kind of depends on the day. So, anything else? <coughs> so I guess kind of with both of those, um, your suggestions of having like, the older kids doing things separate and you're working with the little kids and helping with the tasks and cleaning, that, that's all reached more when the older ones are teens. Yes. So like this organizational level isn't really going to be as pristine as it looks up there uh -oh. until they're older. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Realistic. Yeah. Your expectations are really important. Um, yeah, even when they're in high school, it doesn't look pristine, believe me. <laughs> um, but it's, it's kind of like, it's the structure, it's the outer structure, or it's the goal, but it's not oftentimes what is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's kind of, there's a great deal of flexibility and fluidity within that, but it's kind of, it gives you that structure to know what you're aiming for and what skills you're trying to teach. But um, again, depend, and even students who are in high, their maturity levels vary a great deal too. So like I said, I was pregnant with my fourth when I first started it, um, but, and it changed a lot over the years. But it can... Do you think that lack of maybe perfection in those first years? where the oldest child who's maybe like 9 or 10 still can't actually really help with too much but mm -hmm. still needs a lot of attention, will they catch up <laughs> later? Because the yeah. younger ones at that age are going to get more of you than maybe they did mm -hmm. at that time because you were pregnant or had babies. Right. Does it kind of um, out? You know, Laura Berkwist always recommended, and I would say too, I always gave the lion's share to my older kids because especially when they get to high school, you can't really make up assignments that are lost then. And with your younger kids, the skills are very basic, and they can take a while to learn them. It doesn't matter if you learn to read when you're six or if you're eight. They're going to pick them up, and you can you know, fill in some of those gaps. But when they get, as the older ones get older, like for instance, when I was doing that with my, four, when my fourth grader was my oldest student, I was reading all the books with her, so then when the younger ones got there, I've already read those books, so I have a little less time investment there, but I already am familiar with the storylines, and so I could discuss them with the younger ones. Um, and same with then through high school, that um, that's when the discussions really need to happen. That's a huge time investment. So don't fall into the, into the mistake of thinking that the older they get, the less I have to do. It's kind of the opposite, but it, it all seems to work out. It, you know, I, I didn't invest nearly as much in number nine as I did with number one, but she has a very different life to live because of her, all her brothers and sisters and all the things they're teaching and passing on, some good and some not so good, but still, it works out. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, <laughs> we're very... Um, I guess, intentional about the activities. So right now, the only activity, but all of my kids were, are required, it's just part of our school, is to do piano lessons. Um, there was a time we did orchestra and other kinds of things, but even that was too disruptive to the rest of the family. So you have to look at it from a very family-centered approach. How much is this uh, benefiting the entire family, or what children don't benefit from these children being in these activities. You know, because you, you figure they have the rest of their lives to learn some of these things. So my oldest son never, you know, we didn't do much in terms of flag football or any of that sort of thing. But he's in college now and he plays rugby. So he can do his sports now, but it's, he's in a different place where he can manage it and take care of it. I don't feel 
responsible or like it's my duty or obligation to give them all that other stuff. My duty, my obligation is to have the time, the serenity, the peace, the simplicity to have to do talk with them, to be with them. Just like the last slide, you know, time, just to give them my full attention where I'm not running here and there and all over the place all the time. It would make me crazy and I would not be the kind of mother I think they deserve. And so, yes, maybe they're deprived in some of the extracurricular kinds of things, but I think they can take care of those when they get older. They have a long life ahead of them, and if it's something they have their heart set on, they will be able to pursue it. Did your high schoolers ever do speech and debate, or things really have to go away from kids to turn them into No, I, I'm not even aware if there were any of those opportunities, but, yeah, we didn't. So, mm-hmm. What do you do for yourself in the seven day kind of work we like like for yourself? Yeah. And how do you carve that time out? Like how do you make up on it? Um well again it's uh kind of your expectation and what you uh what you will need. Um my uh thought has always been that um well let's see, it was uh Elizabeth Foss. She also had nine children and homeschooled. She said that whenever she was feeling burned out, she didn't need less of her children. She needed more of them. She needed less of the stuff that was burning her out, less of the outside pressures and things that we you know, run around trying to do. But she just needed more of that snuggle time, more of that just being present, just talking and being with them and not having so much. Maybe simplify your meals a little bit. Maybe, you know whatever you need to do. Um, always cultivating that we're a team, so let's get these chores done together so we'll have more time to do these things. Also, um, for me, uh, it was enough to get up early in the morning. Now, I know when you have infants and babies, I wasn't able to get up at the same time because you know, you'd be up nursing the baby and that sort of thing, so I wouldn't often have that. But I would, I would if I was up in the middle of the night nursing or something, that's when I would be praying. You know, I would do my mental prayer or um, the rosary. You know, those are the things that really fill me or that time with my children. But, um, but I never felt a you know, need to carve anything out or get away or anything like that. So, again, it's kind of an individual thing you want to pray about. But, again, uh, the, being a mother is such a beautiful gift and responsibility and duty, and you really only have, you know, a short time with each of these children and um, and then it's you know and then it's over. So our oldest daughter became a cloistered nun, and I will never regret all the time that you know we spent and were together. It's very beautiful. So, mm -hmm. what kind of outside support do you feel like you have or you have um, to support you from the um, We had a, a homeschool group, and we were a part group that uh, met every week for an afternoon that was uh, just kind of a social, unstructured time. So again, a really nice thing to have because there was no set time where you had to be there. People kind of come and go as it works for their family. Yeah, that was once a week. Um, just this last year, we joined a co-op, and um, that uh, provided another level of support and encouragement and all of that sort of thing. So, but for all those years, it was just the once a week park group that was the only other thing we did or other contact with other families. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Oh. I have a question regarding um, family. I really appreciate the, uh, the schedules that you provided and the concept of spending the um, first part of the day basically with your youngest one. How do you can manage not your personal life but maybe like your relationship with your husband when you're a you know, full-time mother and a teacher and it seems as though because you want them, you see the growth. You spend all the time from the moment you almost wake up, all the way until their bedtime. That by the end you're just mm -hmm. like kind of yeah. exhausted. That you just kind of well, yeah, that, out. that's that a really sense. good question. Yeah. yeah. Think about that type of mm -hmm. So is that normal for me, like a a, a, a family who whose uh, you know, kids are under you know, six years old, homeschooling? Like a, I have a second grader right now, and a kindergartner. That you know, I feel like there's no more time in the day, and I, I do have we do have a lot of extracurricular activities, but uh, I think they're beneficial. So he's supporting that, but it's like I have no more 
Yeah. <laughs> to give them that makes sense. That's normal, and it just oh, yeah. as they get older, it'll just work itself out. It's still very dependent on you. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't know um, if it. Do we have to move on? Do you want me to? We're okay. Okay. Um, I don't know if it. I guess you just mature in your role. You become much more seasoned in it. To me, as they get older, they need a lot of time too. So it used to be, you know, I didn't get much sleep because of the babies. Well, now we're up late at night talking to the high schoolers and the college kids because they still need that. They need, you know, that connection. So, um, so is your question more about connecting with your husband? How do you have time to nurture your marriage? Yes. Um, yeah, that's really important. It has to be a priority. Um, for a long time, we would have carved out time every night. I think it has, I don't think a weekly date night or a monthly date night would have worked for us because I needed it daily. And um, so we would do it at night, but then as our older kids were staying up later, I was so depleted, and so was he. You know, we'd just drop into bed and have no contact. So now it's more, we get up early and we have, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'll sit down and have breakfast with him because he goes to work really early. So I just get up with him and we talk. And we have the more clarity and you have more, oh, they want to talk about this. So I'll get going with him. Thank you.